welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to episode 4 of the Afghan Brief where we will be looking at the latest news from Afghanistan in 15 minutes. I'm your host Sangar Paikar and I'm joined by my co-host Ahmad Walid Kakar. Wa alaikum assalam Sangar, khush keltus. I actually went to the effort of learning how to say it in Uzbeki, so khush keltus Sangar. And yes, it's the fourth episode, we will be covering the latest news from Afghanistan in 15 minutes. A couple of days late, It's but it's not the end of the world because this news is significant and as they say in Deri, derayat drustayat. So we've had this what was called a scholars conference in Afghanistan that lasted three days long. And by Jazir Shama, I will be pressing the um, the start button for 15 minutes. Do I have your permission? Okay, let's go. So in our last episode, we did sort of an analysis of what to expect from this grand conference that was announced and uh, more than four and a half thousand uh, people were attending the conference but now that the conference is behind us and we even have a document and a declaration uh, we need to put this in perspective what did they actually do in Kabul what was the meaning of this conference what did they actually achieve with this conference first and foremost i would like to ask you um you've done the reading so can you give us a quick breakdown of the uh, declaration what are the key points that uh, we need to know about this declaration Sure. So the first thing, so there are 11 points in this declaration, and I'll walk you through them uh, just very briefly, sequentially, because these are ultimately the materialization of what was discussed. So number one, the declaration describes this government as Islamic and Islami Nizam and declares its support for it. Secondly, it declares Bay'a, or its oath of allegiance to the Amir Hebatullah Khanzada, who also spoke at this uh, conference. Thirdly, it called for the release of relief of sanctions, unfreezing of assets to facilitate economic development. Fourthly, it announced its support for the drug combating measures of this government. Fifth, it called on the world to not meddle in Afghan affairs, host hostile elements, and establish diplomatic relations with the government on the basis of mutual respect and principles of non-interference. Fifth, sorry, sixth, it declared armed rebellion against this system as haram, religiously prohibited, and declared that fighting armed rebellion as religiously obligatory. It described Daesh, or I, sorry, seventh, it described Daesh as khawarij, or extremists, and declared that assisting them in any way is religiously forbidden. Eighth, it called on ulama or religious scholars to avoid controversial issues in the media. Ninth, it called for justice, modern and religious education, and progress and development in industry, health, agriculture, and minority and children's rights in light of the Sharia. Tenth, it called for the government to take proper steps to alleviate poverty and unemployment and to defend ter the territorial integrity and strengthen national unity. And finally, it declared support for the government's attempts to return, to support the return of exiled Afghans from the previous regime back to Afghanistan. Those are the 11th points. Uh, here is a question. So it is called a scholars conference, but it didn't entirely consist of scholars, uh, but it wasn't also a jirga. So what do you make out of that? Well, that's exactly it. It wasn't a scholars conference. Uh, in the last episode of the Afghan Brief, we read out, we read out sorry, the uh, tweet from Bakhtar that this said that tribal elders were attending too. And if you're toxic and intolerant like me, you believe that nouns have definitions despite identifying other ways. So someone eating steak every weekend is not vegan and a conference with non-scholars, i.e. tribal elders, is not something you can call a scholars conference. So what can we make of this? We have a scholars conference that wasn't a scholars conference and an assembly that was essentially a jirga, but not called a jirga. And that would have been the natural thing to do given the national history. 
But could it be that by not calling it a jirga and by giving even this gathering a religious color, the government was attempting to preempt any criticism that it was implementing democracy or وَيَحْكُمُ بِمَا غَيْرَ أَنزَلَ Allah or ruling uh, in a way that Allah has not revealed? Uh, that's a criticism that's often leveled at it by those on the Daesh ISKP side of the spectrum. And the declaration did mention Daesh specifically, which indicates the government considers or the assembly considers die some level of threat i don't know it's uh, it's possible that is one explanation but i mean even jamiat islami at one point opposed the terminology of lawyer jirga uh, until obviously they were ousted from power and then needed the lawyer jirga to get back in but that's a that's a separate topic okay fair enough but uh so it wasn't really a scholars conference and it wasn't really a jirga it was something else. Uh, I, I, I accept. Okay, but it wasn't inclusive. We discussed that. Uh, so it's not really a proper jirga. So explain to me, what's the difference between this and what we saw in 2002, 2003, right after the US invasion? They also had sort of a jirga. And uh, were their delegates not handpicked too? I mean... Did they also not yeah, exclude a, their opponents? Yeah, it's a, it's a valid point. It is true, and it's true that this follows the general pattern of monopolistic gatherings, whether we call them jirgas or scholars' conference. Another monopolistic jirga or gathering, but another jirga nonetheless. However, there are two differences, I'd say. First of all, those jirgas involve delegates. Involve, it, sorry, those jirgas consisted of delegates that were picked by a foreign occupying superpower and its clients on the ground. And it also that foreign superpower also meddled in the jirga to achieve its stated outcomes. Secondly, those jirgas took place at a time when the opponents were not just excluded from the jirga, but they were being bombed, tortured, and sent to Guantanamo Bay. So yeah, it's true. This jirga did not include opponents of the current government. It didn't include, let's say, Hamid Karzai or Abdullah Abdullah, but thanks to the amnesty, Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah also not being tortured in the dungeon somewhere or, you know, have a have a bounty on their head. So the same was not true for the Taliban in 2002-2003. That was a little bit too graphic, but uh, fair enough. <laughs> uh, we mentioned in the... Uh, previous uh, Afghan brief uh, the, that the women were not participating. You read out the declaration. Uh, it, is, it, it is mentioning uh, women's rights and modern education, but it's very bland and it's just tucked into one of the points in the declaration. What do you make out of that? Yeah, it's. I mean, it is true that it's not the most uh, elaborate or impassioned mention of women's and children's rights in light of the Sharia, and we never really get a sense of what the Sharia or what the current government's uh, interpretation of the Sharia is. But it's it's a sign of small and incremental progress. Now, why do I say that? I know everyone is going to want to kill me, but if we are to hold the premise that the attendants of this gathering were handpicked, okay, handpicked by the current government, so if all of the attendants are handpicked and we accept that, these issues made it to the declaration. That, Sangar, is progress because people handpicked by the Taliban deemed it important enough that women's rights, children's rights, modern education were to make it to the agenda of the declaration. Now, bearing in mind the historic tensions that have existed with regard to these issues that have remained unresolved, my opinion, that is that is progress. It's not the progress we want, and it's not the you know the final result we're aiming for, which is why I said at the beginning, I think it was small incremental progress. And with regard to female participation as well, I mean, in all honesty, right, my personal the, the thing is is that your level of sadness is measured by your level of expectation. And I never expected uh, women to be attendants in this jirga. And I explained that in my in the previous episode of the Afghan Brief. The whole idea of 
women's political participation is tainted by the superficiality and the corruption of the last two decades. So based on that, I wasn't really expecting uh, there to be women attendance. And if we are to call this a jirga, whether or not, you know, is a, is a different question. But if we are to call it a jirga, then customarily, women don't really attend jirgas anyway but uh that those are the, you know that's the angle from which i looked at it. I, don't, I don't know what did, what did you make of it with regard to the uh education and women's rights section uh i will come to that point later first and foremost uh we have been presented this idea that this grand conference organized by the scholars where they have invited non-scholars, tribal elders, etc., that this is a way for the Islamic Emirate to show that they have, uh, in on the on the domestic front, they have leg- legitimacy. Okay, I would say that first and foremost, branding and marketing this event was a failure. They couldn't really explain what is this event what are they doing so that's uh, that's an issue but when we talk about uh, women's education and women's participation in society uh, I listened to an interview with uh, uh, Abdus Salam Zaif the former uh, ambassador of uh, the first emirate in the 1990s in Pakistan who was in Guantanamo during those jirgas you mentioned? Yes, yes. Uh, he attended this jirga and he was interviewed by Kabul News, uh, a very, very revealing uh, interview for over 50 minutes. He went into detail about what exactly happened in this event. And he said that there were more than uh, 27 com- committees uh, or uh, organized uh, within this four and a half thousand participants and each committee uh, gave one uh, representative and one scholar to a special committee that was sp- created to specifically talk about women's education in Afghanistan and he said that that committee basically discussed all these issues that are causing a lot of um uh, disagreements and he said that fundamentally nobody opposes women's education but rather there are disagreements about the nature of education and the way that it needs to be conducted and you know if you listen to the whole story uh, i would say all this fuss all this tensions all this drama of the last 10 months there is a silver lining okay We have a country where women's education, women's participation in politics has always been very politicized. We have discussed this at length on Afghan Eye, on multiple episodes. Uh, Maligned for it. Yes, but here is the truth. Once you cross the Rubicon, then there is no way back. Oh man, you can't be dropping Roman references like that. No, look, 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 listen. Once this whole uh, drama about girls' education, once this behind us, and once those schools open, once all these old tensions and discussions are over, then we won't see any problems in the future again because our society has moved past this uh, idea of a politicized nature of women's education and participation and from that moment onward even the most conservative circles in the society will not object to any of that so yes it is very depressing it is very uh, difficult to uh, deal with this kind of uncertainty in Afghanistan but I think that the, at the end of the day once this whole uh, situation is behind us. We will have times where we will say, you know what, we're glad. We're glad that we have that mm-hmm. behind us and that that chapter is closed forever. No, I hundred percent agree. And we have, uh, you know, speaking of Roman references, which I appreciate, by the way, another one. Once, inshallah, Allah, this is resolved, and it's not an irresolvable issue. And in the last podcast with Kahal, I also said as well, you know, when internal societal dynamics and mechanisms you know, move forth, then the product of that can be more sustainable. Uh, And then at that point, we will say the die is cast. 
as Julius Caesar once famously said. But I have one minute left. And in this one minute, I'm going to make a final point as well with regards to legitimacy. What we can understand this gathering as it is an attempt to formalize this current government's existence, right? However, if we are to talk about internal versus external legitimacy, I feel like we're going around in circles here because the supporters of this government say this government is legitimate by right of conquest. And the fact that that conquest was facilitated by local ceasefires, which were brokered by local tribal elders, which is, let's say, our Avran, Avran, democracy. The opponents of this government will say it has no legitimacy and it needs to have a consultative process by which it can gain legitimacy. And this assembly is not going to suffice for them because they will say with some good reason that all of the delegates were handpicked. So in that sense, in the legitimacy sense, there was no point in terms of formalizing the government going forward. Maybe you know, there is some element of truth there. And uh, yeah, that is the alarm gone. The final thing I want to say, and this will be 10 seconds, we need to keep in mind the bigger picture here. Uh, Hamid Karzai's government, you know, it formalized the constitution three years after the beginning of the invasion and the occupation. So these things naturally take time. Right, And I know that's not going to be something a lot of people want to hear. And I personally don't believe that we currently as Afghans have three years like Hamid Karzai had because he had all of the international community support but uh, yeah these things take time and I think I went slightly above uh, one minute or so so and on that note uh, this was episode 4 of the Afghan Brief if you like to support our work make sure to visit our patreon page the link is in the description otherwise you can visit our paypal page uh, thank you all for listening please make sure to leave a review and also like and subscribe and share wherever you can find our content thank you very much wassalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam